Hey guys, I'm going to talk about photosynthesis here. It's covered in the book in chapter 10. Essentially, photosynthesis is going to be how plants convert sunlight into glucose. Uh, to give you a, just a general rundown, then we'll take a closer look at this later. But essentially, what goes on is that you have a tree or a plant, anything that has chlorophyll in it or chloroplasts. And if you take a closer look at it, you'd see the leaves themselves. And then if you took a closer look at the leaves, you'd see the cells that make the leaves. And inside the cells are these little green discs, these little green blobs, and those are going to be the chloroplasts. And specifically, this is where all of photosynthesis takes place. There are different parts to the chloroplast, which we'll get to later. But inside each of those little parts are a myriad of all kinds of different chemical equations going on. So we're going to go through what that means and then what this Calvin cycle means and essentially focus in on how chloroplasts are able to make glucose. So we'll back this thing on out and you'll get the idea of how small of a scale that we're working on. And we're going to go over to a PowerPoint which I've produced. Here we go. So, like I said, that's photosynthesis. That's chapter 10. There's basically the idea behind it. You can take a quick look at that if you need to. Um, these are the objectives for the overall concept of photosynthesis or this unit. Um, you may want to check this periodically. I'll put it at the end of the video too, so you can take another look at it. These are the questions that you should be able to answer. So if you are going to watch the video or you're going to read through the book, keep these questions in mind. They're the main objectives for the chapter itself. All right, so if we back out and we take a look at um, a leaf on a plant, which would be here, and we turn that leaf on edge and we looked at the leaf itself, we'd find little open airways for gases to go in and out. We'd find this double layer here on the leaf itself. And if we looked closer at the specialized cells in the leaf, here would be a cell. And those little green discs all over the place inside the cell are going to be your chloroplast. And again, we're going to be focusing in on that chloroplast itself. There are a couple of parts that you need to know the names of inside chloroplast. First of all, there's the stroma. That's all this empty space in here. It's actually a liquid. Um, it's essentially like cytoplasm or cytosol is, but it's inside of a chloroplast. It has specific properties to it. Thylakoids are each one of the little green discs. So think of them as little flat pancakes or whatever you want to think of them as, but that's called a thylakoid. And then they're arranged in stacks inside the chloroplast, and those are called granum. So the stack is called a granum. So this is a granum made up of thylakoids, and it floats around in the stroma. This is what a real chloroplast actually looks like under an electron microscope. And you can see this gray area back here. That would be your stroma. You have stacks of granum, and you have individual thylakoids that make up those stacks. All right. So the book has a pretty decent diagram. Uh, we'll take a quick look at it here. This is the overall idea of photosynthesis. Water and carbon dioxide are going to go into the chloroplast. So this whole thing here is the chloroplast, the whole bean-shaped thing. Water and carbon dioxide are going to go in. There's two major reactions to this overall idea. Um, the light reactions and the Calvin cycle. Oxygen comes out of light, light reactions and uh, sugars come out of the Calvin cycle. In more of a written down format, this is the general idea. Uh, photosynthesis is broken into two steps. They're called light dependent and light independent reactions. Light dependent reactions depend on light, obviously. They need sunlight or some type of light to hit them in order to work. Light independent reactions do not. That also implies that it doesn't really matter when they happen. Light dependent reactions typically need sun, sunlight, so it happens during the day. Light independent reactions don't necessarily need that, so they're happening pretty much at all times. They're sometimes referred to as light and Calvin reactions, so you'll hear me interchange those just because I'm comfortable with those terms. So either way, know that that's what I'm talking about. Um, essentially, the light dependent reactions create energy. Energy is stored in a molecule called ATP. We've talked about that. And then light independent reactions, the second step of this whole thing, they use ATP to, and I, put, I wrote down orchestrate enzymatic sugar production. It's just a fancy way of saying they use the ATP uh, created during the light dependent reactions to basically make sugars in the light independent reactions. So light dependent makes energy. Light independent uses that energy to make sugar. 
We're going to take a closer look at the um, steps of the light reactions here. Um, and we'll take a couple of different views at it. The book has a couple of diagrams that I wanted to walk through. Uh, one of the first steps here is that water itself goes into the light reactions. And it's going to get split up and it's going to create oxygen out of that. So the water is going to get broken into oxygen and hydrogen. The hydrogen is going to get added onto a molecule called NADP plus to become NADPH. If you can recall from respiration, that's very similar to that same molecule, NADP. Um, also, ADP and P are going to come into the light reactions, and they're going to get kicked out as ATP. So these two forms of energy are going to be used later on. The way that light gets broken up and the way that these things absorb all that energy is through sunlight coming into the light reactions. And you can kind of see how this is a granum here with a bunch of thylakoids all stuck together. The ATP and NADPH are used to power the Kelvin cycle, which takes in carbon dioxide and through a series of steps, much like the Krebs cycle, they use ATP and NADPH to rearrange carbon dioxide and other molecules into sugars. Once the ATP and the NADPH are used up, they're broken back down into their parts and recycled back over the light reactions and the whole thing continues on and on and on and on. Okay, so there's some checkpoint questions. I'll give you a couple seconds here before I start again. You can go ahead and pause this and answer these questions. Okay, so before we get into these light dependent reactions really closely here, we have to understand why plants are green. Um, this would be standard wavelengths of light or standard wavelengths of energy. And what we can see here is we'll take this little sliver of uh, wavelength here and we'll expand it out and we can say that these are the wavelengths of light that we can actually visually see. So if something has a wavelength of 380 nanometers, very very small measurement, um, it appears to our eye as purple and all the way up to 750 nanometers it appears to our eye as red. Anything above that wavelength, longer wavelength, becomes infrared, we can't see that anymore. Anything shorter than this becomes ultraviolet, we can't see that anymore. All of these different types of wavelengths of energy exist. These are only ones that we can see. So what do plants specialize on? Well, plants take in light and they will specialize on pretty much the whole spectrum of color of lights, except for one, green. They don't like green very much. It doesn't really help them very much. Uh, their pigments and their enzymes and their proteins and everything else inside of them basically just reflect the green light. They absorb everything else and they use it to their advantage and we'll learn how. But essentially plants are green because they're reflecting green and they absorb every other color light. This brings up some interesting questions. If you shine a red light on a plant in a dark room, the plant will appear gray because it's absorbing all of the red light and it's not reflecting anything so it'll appear kind of gray or black. If you take a green light and shine it on a plant in a dark room, the plant will appear green. This is why when you go out at night and you have a flashlight with you and you shine it on the ground, the light kind of sprinkles on the different colors of the, of the grass and whatnot, and the grass ends up being kind of green, but on the edges of that light where there's not really good light, the grass still appears kind of grayish or tones of black and white. All right, so light reactions, I'm not going to read all of this to you, but basically what we're going to talk about these pigments that are essentially proteins. Um, we're also going to talk about how water gets split here. Um, an enzyme called hydrolase, hydrolase, uh, ends up cutting up water. And the whole idea of these things called photosystems are to vibrate electrons. So we'll talk more closely about that here in a second. You can come back to this slide, make a note of the time on the YouTube video, and come back to this if you need to. Essentially the book starts out by trying to describe what a photosystem is. And this is a photosystem, and we can see this lipid bilayer of the chloroplast itself, and electrons come in, hit different pigments or different mini proteins basically within this big protein complex here, the whole thing, and it basically vibrates the different proteins. They take photons in and they shake with them. And they hand that over to a final little 
group of molecules called chlorophyll A. That's chlorophyll. That's the name of the chemical that you've become so familiar with. And what that chemical does is it, it's a complex that holds onto electrons, vibrates them up to a higher level, and then will pass that electron down a, a, a transport chain of proteins. Very, very similar to the electron transport chain or electron transport system. This is a animation or a computer model of what a um, what one of those photosystems looks like. Again, falling back on what we've learned about beta sheets, you can see the little cones that are the rods that they show here, and alpha helices, you can see them all twisting around in here. Um, and the whole thing is just one massive complex of a bunch of different proteins. Very complex, but ultimately what it does is it's got a specific active site that actually is small enough to hold an electron in place and let it vibrate. It's pretty cool. All right, so the book goes through a couple of different ways of describing these different photosystems. Photosystem 2 happens first, and then photosystem 1 will happen later on. This isn't trying to be confusing or anything. They discovered photosystem 1 first. They named it photosystem. And then somebody came along and said, hey, there's a second photosystem, so we're going to name it photosystem 2. And then about 15 years later, they found out, oh, crap, photosystem 2 happens before photosystem 1, but we don't want to rewrite the textbook. So they just left it as such. So this one was discovered second, um, but they just left it in the row. All right. So ultimately, here's what ends up happening. Water comes into this whole mess. So water is going to come into this gray rectangle back here is going to be your photosystem. And notice that this is, again, this is happening inside the thylakoid, inside the chloroplast. So this uh, water molecule is going to come in and hydrolase is going to split it up. It's going to split it into oxygen, hydrogen, which they don't show here, which we'll talk about later, and electrons. So the electrons used to make the bonds are broken. Those electrons go into this photosystem here called P680. That means it is absorbing the 680 nanometer of light, pretty much red light. It really likes red light. So photons come in, they excite all these little pigments inside of the photosystem, and they get passed along and they finally start vibrating these electrons, and these electrons become uh, energized. What those electrons then do is they get passed along a couple of different proteins, uh, plastoquinone, plastocyanin, cytochrome complex, um, I'm not too concerned that you know the names, just know what they're doing. They're just passing electrons down. In the process, we're going to make some ATP. I'll describe that later. And then it's going to get passed along to photosystem 2, or photosystem 1, sorry, photosystem 1. So photosystem 1 is going to accept those electrons. Again, another wavelength of light, this one is 700 nanometers, is going to hit these pigments, going to hop around, vibrate all these things, take these electrons, excite them one more time. Another protein called ferrodoxin is going to come along, pass those electrons along, and they're going to pass it along to an enzyme called NADP plus reductase. Remember, anytime you have ACE, that's going to be an enzyme. That reductase is going to take those two electrons and some hydrogen from back here, and it's going to add it together. And it's going to take that hydrogen and the NADP, and it's going to create NADPH with these electrons used for bonding. And ADPH, if you can recall, is kind of a lower form of energy. Combine it with this higher form of energy, and we're going to have some energy for the next couple of steps. This is kind of an analogy that the book gives. A photon is going to give that electron the energy it needs to hop up to a higher level of energy. And then as it trickles through those different protein complexes, it gives off a little bit of energy to create ATP. And then it sets down into photosystem 1. Photon whacks it again raises up an energy level, that gets passed on as electron carrier uh, over into NADPH. A little bit better view, I think, uh, comes into play here, uh, and that would be that this uh, incoming light here is going to hit our photosystem 2 in this area. Water is going to come in and it's going to split into uh, hydrogen, which is located here, and oxygen, and what is going to end up happening is that the oxygen is going to get released and the hydrogen is going to get passed along. The electrons get held into place by photosystem 2. They get excited, raise their energy level, move along this whole chain, come out into here. Um, when they go through the cytochrome complex, it gives it energy to pull four hydrogens across. That becomes important here in a second. The electrons continue along their whole pathway. They get excited by photosystem 1. They get passed on to that ferrodoxin, which passes along to NADP plus reductase. 
combining with some hydrogen 